But just to come back to a point you made earlier, just talking about um, innovation, mm. um, you know, that's that's the sort of thing that that people can take quite a, a formulaic approach to. Whereas actually, it's quite an organic, creative thing. What do you see as the the kind of what are the barriers within organizations at the moment to accessing innovation within supply chain? Because we're always hearing that people are really excited and really interested in bringing more innovation into their, into their business. But what, what, what do you think might be stopping some companies from, from achieving that? So I think, I think the main, the main problem that companies have when um, trying to talk about innovation, encourage innovation from their suppliers is that, um, the procurement teams and the suppliers don't have you know, the same word again, that don't have the right relationship. So um, if I look back at the, the places I've worked and the clients I've had, um, if I'm honest, I haven't really seen this, this done very well, uh, generally speaking. Um, and I think it's because people get, um, if you think about an, uh, a set of objectives that a procurement team might have for the year, um, there'll be all the normal ones, cost reduction and payment terms, and and then and then there'll be things about sustainability, and there'll be things about numbers of suppliers, and all the all the kind of usual suspects. And then increasingly, there'll be something in there around innovation, um, and that I'll kind of get rolled out in my experience to everybody. You must deliver some innovation within your category this year. Okay, great. The problem with that approach is it's, it's bonkers <laughs> because you can't expect every category to have innovation. You can only really expect innovation to come where if you think about the, the typical sort of crowdic portfolio structure for categories, where you've got high risk and uh, high, high spend and, and where you've got um, sort of in the in the strategic box, um, that is where you can expect to find innovation. You you cannot expect a supplier who's in a leverage box. So there's loads of competition. They're being really hit on price. Um, you can't go through a really aggressive meeting with with one of those suppliers, and then at the end of it, say, right, let's talk about innovation. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work. It's madness to think that you could. Well, and the, so the, the, the supplier is going to be sitting there yeah, feeling sorry. crushed and thinking, well, if I've got some great innovation, I don't feel very inclined to share it with you because, you know, what's in it for me kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. You've just told me, unless I reduce my prices by 30% in a week's time, I'm going to lose this business that we've had for 20 years. Um, and now you want me to open all my... Uh, you know, vaults of my innovation and share them with you. Well, I don't feel like doing that. I don't feel particularly trusted right now. So it comes down to trust. Um, so that's the first thing. I think the relationship's got to be right. I think you can't you can't have an adversarial relationship and uh, expect innovation to fall. Now, what what I'm not saying is that all relationships, you know, can't be adversarial. I'm just saying that where you've got uh, a category that sits nicely in a leverage box and it you know that i'm not saying that's the wrong place to put it i'm just saying don't expect innovation to fall out of those suppliers um so you, i think having the same objective for every category is bonkers i think you've got to pick innovation in the in the logical places that it will flow from and that's where the relationship is much more aligned to partnership and trust and 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 sort of openness Gen, you know genuine not just lip service so that's the first thing second thing follows on from that really it's about I think it's got to be a two-way thing. So I, I don't think you can, uh, as a buyer, um, you can say to your supplier, tell me about all your innovation and I'm going to write it all down and, and, and we're going to take it and we're going to figure out a way that that's going to make us money. I think, you know, in order to have that relationship that I've just talked about, it's two-way. So therefore, the, related, the conversation around innovation should be two-way as well. So, you know, I think the buyer should be coming to the supplier with innovation ideas. You know, maybe they've got some things that they're doing in their business that the supplier might benefit from. Maybe there's um, things that they can work on together. I don't think it all has to be a present that's given to the buyer on a plate, you know, wrapped up in a bow. 
um, something that it probably can be co-designed. Um, it makes sense that it has it to be, be. Yeah, it's, it makes sense that it has to be a collaborative process, really. Hmm. Um, but just just picking up on on one of the points you men mentioned there about saying in the strategic box where it might be high spend and high risk, that's where innovation would come from. So the, one of the questions that raises in my mind is, how does that work for the smaller suppliers? Because that's, that's likely to be a tougher area for them to get into in many companies. And yet I would say it's the potential that there's disproportionately more innovation that could be taken from those really agile, small suppliers that have to work so hard to be in the game, they're growing, um, do you think that's maybe possibly a bit of a problem as well? Yeah, I think it's a it's a great point. Um, I think when I'm talking about high spend, high risk, I'm talking about the category really. Yeah. Um, now, I think it's really important um, for innovation and for sustainability and for all sorts of reasons for continuity of supply. I think it's really important to make sure that it's not just really big companies that you have in that box. You know, there's no reason really why um, a high category supply, uh, sorry, a high um, a strategic category can't be um, supplied by a, a smaller supplier or a number of small suppliers um, or even a mixture between big suppliers and, and small suppliers. You know, I think um, the days where you have sole supply, there's still a place for it, um, but... Um, uh, you know, arguably um, not in not in that box. Um, I think those days are gone. And I think, you know, sometimes what you've got to do if, you know, so if, if a supplier is in that box because the risk is high, then one of the ways of reducing that risk is by developing more of a market, more alternatives. And sometimes you have to take a bit of a leap of faith with some smaller suppliers in order to help them along that journey so that in the future actually that category will be less risky because there are more supply options out there um so i think it's really important actually to to not just assume that innovation is the you know the, the playground of the big players i mean obviously for things things that are technology based um and, and require lots of investment could could well be you know more naturally aligned to big suppliers but I don't think it has to be the case. No, and I think, again, it comes back to uh, that inherent thing of visibility. You know, what is your supply chain? Are there, are there some real gems in your supply chain that you're not aware of? And, you know, it's like if you look at an organisation and, and all of the people that are part of that organisation, if you've got clear objectives and you're all rowing in the same direction, then everybody's opinion is really important because it's, it's driving towards that objective. And the same exists within the supply chain, but the voices need to be heard. If there's a yeah. clear direction of what you want out of your supply chain and you've got the visibility that you can see people that are doing a great job, I think a lot of companies, in particularly in services specifically, will not be able to see that at the moment. And it's, it comes back to what I was talking about around supplier comparison and things like that. Um, you know, you might have somebody work with a small innovative company and they take a bit of a risk in a particular area, which might be more of a low risk area. Um, they take a risk, work with a smaller supplier and their feedback might be, they might have, for example, a quality score that's based on innovation as one category of that quality score. And these guys might be constantly getting five stars for everything that they do. Then if the organization can see that, that's something that they can set, potentially take into higher risk areas, but they need to surface that type of information. And yeah, as I say, otherwise these people just, these, these businesses just won't be heard. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, if you look at the UK um, environment in particular, but makes the same on a global sense, some of these smaller companies, they have to fight so hard to grow and they have to fight so hard to compete. Um, and they're very, very driven um, to, to create a great solution for their customer and, and um, be invited back to do more. Yeah. Um, no, I completely agree. And I think, um, you know, when you were talking about this idea of, innovation not really blossoming within an adversarial environment um it's almost it's, it's almost like you can't force someone to be creative no it's it's, it, it's it's not necessarily an on the spot process so it can't just be a tick box to say have you delivered us some some innovation what is the innovation this week yeah. 
it's yeah. um it's as i say that's where i think it comes back we talked about relationships we talked about communication being key communication absolutely and relationships in this sense where if you get these smart suppliers that are doing business for you doing doing delivering services for you if they understand your overall objectives and they're bought into that journey they can be thinking away in the background great for them because they get more work out of you but great for you because you've got this extended part of your business going away trying to do clever things i yeah. think it's a really exciting part of it and when you when you tie in things like the demand around sustainability and stuff like that as well csr i mean that's a huge huge area for businesses because for so many particularly big organizations their business very much is their brand mm -hmm. and if they can't link their purpose and their brand and their and everything that they do um they won't attract young people particularly to go and work for them but also some suppliers it is a two-way thing the suppliers might not want to work with the organization so you might have the real best supplier in a real key area who thinks well actually your values don't align with mine um, or you might have the other way around for suppliers as well where their, their their values if they match up to the company's values there's you know that's something that works very well yeah no i agree i think it's increasingly important for um for people joining companies to you know really a lot of um, a lot of companies are very similar now. If you're pick, if you're a, if you're a, a new entrant into a you know into your career, um, a lot I think a lot of people you know will base their decisions based on the values a lot of the time. You know, all things being equal, um, if you know for the same sort of money, same sort of same sort of job, they're going to they're going to pick a company where you know that that alignment is 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 more in line with with their values. I think, um, and rightly so. Um, arguably that's the way it should be definitely something that we're seeing absolutely yeah. some, some really really big companies that are putting this absolutely front and center it's not a box ticking exercise no, it's no, absolutely become no. kind of fundamental um and as i say when you look at young people who are coming into the work workplace that's probably in a lot of cases the number one criteria that they're making judgments on as to whether they want to work for a company and it applies right the way through however any kind of resource channels um and it's cultural as well. I mean, I think the other the other thing that I was going to say on the topic of innovation is, is around culture, and it's it's around um, risk. So, um, and and I think actually of all the discussion we've had, I think this is the most important bit. Is um, in my opinion that the reason that innovation often doesn't work in a company is because of that company's attitude towards risk. And so, and we touched on this earlier, but, um, you know, I think there's, there's stats out there, you know, with various, various degrees in there, but I think, you know, it's generally accepted, I think, between sort of two, uh, three quarters and, and sort of 95% of all innovations fail. And so if you're in a culture as a company where, you know, failure is not acceptable um, and, you know, anything you spend has to yield a result then you know why on earth would you expect to be really successful in innovation you know you've almost got to be and culturally you've got to have that mindset to say actually um we expect to fail you know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do some innovation here with uh with these suppliers uh, and we expect it to yield nothing at all for quite a long time and you should expect that, and you should expect that we might have to fund some of that failure. Um, and and there you go. And and you know, and most most companies say, no, what are you talking about? Um, we just want the innovation. But you know, the point is, if you look at any of the innovative companies out there, they're all prepared to to play the long game um, and fail, fail well. You know, by by which I mean, you know, learn learn from the failure you know, clearly stop doing something when it, when it clearly um, proves not to work, but you can't expect unless you're very lucky to innovate uh, and, and get an instant win. So I think a lot of companies, particularly publicly traded ones that need to deliver quick results, I just, you know, just don't have, you know, it's not necessarily their fault, but they just don't have that culture of, okay, we'll, we'll go on that journey and we'll be prepared to fail a lot uh, before we win um and you know so i think that is the major barrier uh I'm not sure how you overcome it uh, other than just sort of change your mindset but it's easier said than done i think yeah i wonder how many companies actually implement the innovative 
uh, ideas and projects that are put forward as well. So companies might be paying lip service to it and maybe even investing in saying, let's get some innovation, you know, get suppliers putting forward some innovative solutions. But, but I wonder how many of them just sit on the shelf where, where that risk factor um, is too high. And the company spent the money on it anyway, because it's a, in that case, a, a kind of a box ticking exercise. Yeah. And you, and you get the, you get the attitude as well. well. Why should we be the guinea pig? You know, we're, we're effectively paying for this supplier to road test something and then they're going to go out and make loads of money if it's successful. Well, I'm sorry, that again comes down to your relationship. You know, that's a, that's not the, the, uh, that's not the opinion of somebody who's in a genuine partnership. That's a, that's a suspicious opinion from somebody who, you know, is not on that on the right square with that supplier in order to innovate in the first place. So yeah, exactly. They could be taking the point of view of saying, "What's this relation? Where's this relationship going to go for us as an organisation? Never mind what happens elsewhere. If this company is successful, maybe that's even better for them." 